Good afternoon, folks. This is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, and I'm coming to you today with a sermon about Jesus and what he said about his future when he started to announce that he was going to be crucified, and then how that relates to us. A very important concept, so I hope you enjoy, and I hope you continue to listen. So here's the text. From that time forth, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So Jesus prophesies his death and resurrection, and then he says, if you want to be with me, you got to follow me. And if you plan to follow me, You've got to identify with me at the point of the cross. You've got to identify with my death. Now you'll notice that I eliminated the final verse in the chapter. I did this because it really fits with Matthew 17, as we will see when we study that section. You'll also notice, I'm sure, that I quoted from Jesus' words, to his disciples, not just from his words about himself. The reason is that as he is, so are we in this world. Jesus' words about himself, that relates to us, and that's why he discusses both in the same context. Martyrdom was a very real thing in the early church. And in order to be a Christian, you pretty much did have to be willing to die for your faith. So, Jesus' life was programmed. He was born to die to pay for our sins. He himself makes this reference in many places, but none really so eloquent as here as Matthew 26, 53, when he says, to his disciples upon his arrest, he says, do you think that I can't appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? He had just been in the garden of Gethsemane. He had gone through that terrible battle over his approaching death and his crucifixion. And then he says this, how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must be so. He also said of his life in John chapter 10, he said, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. It is true, as Peter said, that his murderers were responsible for Jesus' crucifixion and death because Peter says in Acts chapter 2, he says, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did through him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken. 
and by wicked hands you have crucified and slain him. Now, of course, this was always God's plan. Jesus, in his pre-incarnate self, agreed to this plan. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, one of the great passages of the New Testament on the incarnation says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not something to be grasped after, to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and he was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And folks, many passages from both Old and New Testaments confirm this. And we've, we're discussing that on the next slide. It's important to know that Jesus chose to die. He chose to die because he wanted to pay for our sins because, because God loved us and Jesus loved us so much that he needed to rescue us from our sins. He wanted that. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 27, after his resurrection, and when he's on the Emmaus road with the two disciples, it says, he said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now Luke's statement indicates that Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection appear throughout the Old Testament. Moses and the prophets was kind of code for the whole Old Testament, beginning at the first five books. Moses and all the prophets. So, for example, the entire Jewish sacrificial system was intended to convey Jesus' life and death for us. It leaves a trail of blood behind, as Leviticus 17.11 tells us. When the Lord says to Moses, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it upon the altar to make atonement for your soul. For it is blood that makes atonement for the soul. And this is fulfilled in Jesus' death and resurrection. Moving to the New Testament, we read, Behold, the Lamb of God in John chapter 1, verse 29, again in verse 35. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And John is probably referring to Jesus' fulfillment of the Passover in Exodus 12. As Paul says, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Now, at the end of the age, Jesus is still the Lamb as well as he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. In Revelation chapter 5, we read this, Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, which is an interesting statement considering that he was the child of David. He is the Root as well. The Root of David has prevailed to open the book and to lose its, loose its seven seals. And I beheld, this is John speaking, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had just been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, very symbolic, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he, that is the Lamb of God, Jesus, the root and offspring of David, he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts, four living creatures, and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them an incense vial and golden harps. 
or I'm sorry, golden harps and um, golden vials and incense and harps. We'll get it right eventually, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals of it. For you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Folks, Jesus' death was a forever event in the sense that it changed the course of all creation, including the entire universe. Everything that has ever been made, the course of that was changed through Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, is it any wonder then that you and I are called to take up our cross and follow him? The cross of Jesus is where we identify with him. And that's why Jesus' next words involve us. He says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? <clears throat> that is quite the question, you know. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you give for your soul? Would you give, would you get money in exchange for it? Would you get political power? How about just immense influence in the world? People have given up their souls for all kinds of useless things because not one of those things lasts beyond this life. John said the world is passing away and the desires of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. <clears throat> now this is why, by the way, Jesus reacted the way he did when Peter attempted to dissuade him from his journey to Jerusalem and his choice of death at the hands of wicked men. The words, get behind me, Satan, refer to Peter's unintentional rejection of God's plan for Jesus and for himself. In John chapter 12, we read these words, the hour is coming the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He who loves his life shall lose it, and he who hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And this is one of the most important statements in all the Bible. Jesus says, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. And then, of course, Jesus thinks of himself and he says, now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause I came to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. And from heaven the Father replies, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Now at this point, folks, Jesus is very near his death. And he's giving a reminder for all who belong to him that our life is bound up with his. What he faced could be our fate as well. And if it is, so what? We will live again. And we will be with him forever. That's the thing. If you follow Jesus Christ, you will never really die. As John says, as Jesus says in John chapter 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. 
Remember that when you face difficulty, folks. And may God bless you richly today. This is Steve Bradley, God's wordsmith, signing off.